Easter, 1066. Harold Godwinson rides south from Northumbria. Not long now for a decent meal and some sleep. As a new king, he must secure his power right across England. Harold had grabbed the throne as soon as King Edward the Confessor died. Requiescat in pace. Sidelining Edgar, Edward's great nephew, and convincing the Anglo-Saxon nobles to elect him instead. Now, with his loyal brother Gerth, Harold has been visiting the often rebellious Northern Earls. Well, they know that well. At least he got a wife out of it. Mm. Do you like her? I do. But that's not the point. <laughs> no. The crucial problem facing Harold in 1066 was to try to create unity in the Midlands and the North. And his way of doing this was to abandon the wife of 20 years, Edith Swanneck, and to marry, instead, the sister of the Earls of Northumbria and Mercia, who is also called Edith. So two Ediths. Mm. Be interesting when they mate. Mm. <laughs> All seemed well in Harold's England, but the reality was that the new king was beset by problems, both at home and abroad. To the south, William, Duke of Normandy, and to the north, the Viking, King Harold Hardrada, are both plotting to destroy Anglo-Saxon England. William is one of the most powerful and impressive men in Western Europe at this time. And he genuinely believed that 15 years previously, he had been promised the throne of England by England's king. And he was not going to let anything get in the way of that claim. But a thousand miles to the north, William has a powerful rival. Uh, come on! You useless Vestlinger. Even an old man like me could do better than that. Come on! Hardrada is the ultimate Viking. A despotic warrior who's battle-hardened from years of war. Come on! Hardrada is still ambitious. Like all Vikings, he still craves glory and plunder and fame. Kiss my thin lipped axe! Harold faces danger from overseas, but also at home, in the shape of a younger brother called Tostig. Tostig had been stripped of the earldom of Northumbria when powerful nobles rebelled against his tyranny. To avoid a civil war, he'd been sent into exile. But Tostig is too angry to wait for his new allies. He decides to go it alone. Two weeks later, and England is under attack. Come on, man! Let's show that! Filthy bastard! Sixty warships are closing in on the Isle of Wight. In a vicious act of family betrayal, Tostig brings war to his own brother's kingdom. Soon we will have landfall. I've invited three historians to get inside the heads of our competing warlords. This is lies, lies, lies. All you ever speak are lies. They'll explore the thinking behind their battle plans. We're going to continue down the coast to the mouth of the Humber, and we're going to attack York. Harold Godwinson. William of Normandy. And Harold Hardrada. 
now ask, just what was Tostig up to? I can't say that I'm particularly surprised that he's upset. He wants his land and his power back. But I am surprised by the way he's going about it. He is crossing the channel from Flanders with 60 ships and heading for the Isle of Wight. What does he hope to achieve? I am as bewildered as you. It was only a few weeks ago that Tostig pledged me his support. So what is he up to? Is he expecting me to cross over and join him? Because if so, he is making a serious mistake. I am not going to be ready to launch my own invasion for months yet. Well, don't forget that Tostig has already offered me the chance to become King of England by proposing a joint invasion from the north late in the summer. I've no idea what he's up to. Maybe his lust for revenge against you, Harold, has finally tipped him over the edge because he's acting like he's gone totally insane. Landing unopposed, Tostig ran riot on the Isle of Wight. He attacked people, burned buildings, and stole food and weapons. A direct assault on his brother Harold's authority. He had to be stopped. Back in the 11th century, it would have taken about two days for news of Tostig's invasion of the Isle of Wight to reach Harold in London. He immediately set off for the south coast. And he gathered together what the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle describes as the largest concentration of land and naval forces ever assembled by a king of England. England had a very particularly impressive and sophisticated way of raising an army at this point. On the one hand, there are the personal bodyguard of the king himself and of all his main nobles, the house carls. These are professional soldiers, effectively. In addition to that, the structure of English governance through counties or shires and hundreds enables a king to raise men from the countryside, the feared, as it's known, and they will fight for their locality. Hearing that his brother was on his way with overwhelming force, Tostig fled, sailing up the east coast of England. He attempted to take land in the north, but there he faced his old enemies, now Harold's newly nurtured allies, the Northern Earls. <laughs> Tostig's army is outnumbered and is beaten back. But Tostig escapes. With just 12 remaining ships, he makes it to the safe haven of Scotland. A convenient northern base to link up with Harold Hardrada and the Vikings. King Harold had been tested for the first time in his short reign. He managed to repel the first invasion of England in 1066, but he must have known that wouldn't be the only challenge to his authority that year. Tostig might have fled, but Harold knew that across the Channel in Normandy, William's plans were advancing fast. William's headquarters were at Caen. Now one of Normandy's largest cities. In the 11th century, this was a small town, which William fortified into a power base. From his castle, he set about winning political support for his invasion. People would have been very unsure about the idea of simply going in and conquering another country and killing an anointed king. The king, of course, Harold, has been anointed with holy oil. He is God's chosen representative of his people, and therefore the act of killing him unsettles people across Europe. 
William quickly realized that he'd need to appeal to an even higher power to back him up. It was time to recruit God. William and his wife Matilda were devout Christians. They built two great abbeys in a grand display of their piety. William turned to Pope Alexander II for help. He sent envoys all the way to Rome to put his case for the invasion. Amen. For William to gain the support of the Pope was very important to him in terms of the legitimacy of his claim, that he could say that God upheld his claim over England and that those who opposed him were the sinners. The basis of William's case for invasion was that Harold was a usurper. First of all, William said that Edward the Confessor had promised him the throne 15 years before and Harold had stolen it. But William had a further ace up his sleeve. He said that Harold himself had promised him the throne just two years before. The story of what happened is told in our most famous record of 1066 the Bayeux Tapestry. Harold sails across the channel. Storms blow him onto French soil, where he's arrested. William secures Harold's release and brings him to Normandy. And there, in the key scene, Harold makes an oath over holy relics, promising to support William's claim to the English throne. What the Bayer Tapestry doesn't explain is why Harold was at sea in the first place. Another unique document offers a clue. Hidden in the National Library in Brussels is an ancient book containing an epic poem. The Carmen, or Song of the Battle of Hastings, is now regarded as our earliest surviving account of 1066. It's packed with details that challenge much of what we thought we knew. The Carmen has an interesting piece of information about Harold's trip to Normandy. There's a line where it says, annulus est, illi testis, concessus et ensis. William was granted a ring and a sword. Now, the ring and the sword were two of the items with which you're invested when you're made a king. So this is sort of strongly suggesting that Harold was sent, bearing these tokens, promising William the kingship. But another ancient writer suggests that William may not have been totally honest himself. He says that Harold was in Normandy deliberately. And he was there to try and secure the release of two of his family members whom Duke William had been holding hostage for 15 years. I wanted to free my brother and my nephew, who, I might add, you had been holding against their will for years. Right. We agreed that I would free your nephew immediately and that I would free your brother once I'd become king and there was one solitary condition and that was that you had to give me your backing as Edward's successor. Well, that was all. No, there you go, you've admitted it. I wanted to get back safely to England with my brother, with my nephew, so I had to agree to your demands. But you are admitting that you swore an oath, you're admitting that you swore it on relics, and that being so, you will agree that I am within my God-given right to cross over to England and to take what is mine. I think that anyone would agree. William's envoys set out these arguments to Pope Alexander. Would he back him in his campaign against the usurper Harold? Pope Alexander agreed. He accepted all William's arguments. He even went so far as to issue William with a papal banner that his men could carry before them into battle. It gave William's invasion the status almost of a crusade. 
Dame. God will keep you safe. He'll need to. But I believe he will. William was building up his already mighty military force for invasion. And now, he had God on his side. All of which was bad news for King Harold and for Anglo-Saxon England. A thousand miles from Normandy, Harold Hardrada is in communication with Tostig in Scotland and preparing his own invasion from the north. Are you ready, Asga? Aye, my lord. And your axe finally home, Uncle? It is, my lord. Shall we do battle? Like Duke William, Harold Hardrada was hungry for more conquest. But as a Viking, he believed he had a God-given right to invade England. It's what the Vikings had been doing for centuries. But Hardrada also knew that this was his last throw of the dice. This was his last chance to conquer more territory or cement his own legend. So when Harold's vengeful brother Tostig encouraged Hardrada to invade England, Hardrada leapt at the chance. Now, I'm assembling my troops here on the Solent Isles, just off the west coast. Both of you, I think, know that Vikings know their way around ships. Well, I've got 500 of them and 30,000 men, all of them battle-hardened warriors. So this is going to be an invasion to make the whole of England quake. The core of Harold Hardrada's army is made up of his house cars. These are his household retinue. They're professional soldiers, experienced killers, battle-hardened from 16 years of war. But there's also another type of warrior, and that's the berserkers. These were warriors who were liable to slip into fits of psychotic rage. They were impervious to pain. They had no fear of death, and I think there could be little more frightening in a battle than fighting somebody who just keeps coming at you even when your spear is in his belly. I kill without compunction and remember all my killings. I have caused the death of 13 of my enemies. Hardrada was also a poet. He was a scald in Viking terms. Um, he created poetry. He wanted his name to live forever. So he did the deeds and then wrote about them. I found myself creeping from forest to forest with little honor. Who knows? I may become renowned far and wide. In the end. Hardrada believed that victory would ensure his immortal Viking legacy. He makes provision for Norway to be ruled by his son in his absence, which may suggest that he doesn't expect to come back, that he expects to be ruling England. With the grace of St. Olaf shining down on me. I will end my days, King of Norway, and King of England. Thousands of miles apart, two great forces were preparing to invade England. Their target was King Harold, but there was, in fact, another possible rival for the throne the natural successor of the Anglo-Saxon royal dynasty, a boy 
whose claim was better than any of them. The boy's identity is revealed in a document from the 1050s. This is an extraordinary page from an extraordinary manuscript, the Liber Vitae, the Book of Life. But one particular group of entries is extremely interesting, because here we've got Edward Rex, King Edward, and Edgar Clito, Edgar Atheling. And Atheling means prince or throne-worthy individual, someone who is being groomed for the succession. King Edward the Confessor might have been childless, but in Edgar, he had a blood relative, a direct descendant of Alfred the Great. But when Edward had died, Harold hadn't found it hard to sideline the young prince in his own bid for the throne. The problem with Edgar Atheling was that he was very young. He was a teenager at most, and he doesn't seem to have made any impression on people. He seems to have hung around at court doing nothing. So throughout 1066, as William and Hardrada prepared their invasions, Edgar remained in the background, watching events unfold. But by the end of that year, Edgar would have one more chance to become king. Summer. Harold is now based on the Isle of Wight, from where he marshals the defense of his kingdom. He's still unaware of the Viking threat, or of his brother Tostig's alliance with Hardrada. Harold's sole aim is to counter the expected Norman invasion from the south. It's just a matter of time, that's all. You heard what they say about him in Normandy. But he burst into tears because some people called him a common tanner. He then chopped off their hands and feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can blame them. A hundred miles to the south, William is massing a formidable force of ships, horses and men at Dive on the coast of Normandy near Caen. The exact number of ships that William had with him here at Dive has long been the source of debate amongst historians. But there is a document from the time that does give us a few clues. This is a list of naval obligations for his nobles. And it says that 14 of his barons, plus his wife Matilda, all contributed 777 ships. And it says that the total number of ships with William was more than 1,000. By the 4th of August, 1066, William's vast invasion fleet was ready to set sail. But William had a problem. In order for him and his fleet to get safely to the other side of the channel, conditions had to be just right. And the wind kept blowing from the wrong direction. So he waited. Days passed and the conditions didn't improve. William and his army were stuck here on the wrong side of the channel. William is forced to wait. Every day, he must feed his troops, while they kill nothing but time. It's been estimated that William gathered an invasion force of up to 14,000 men. That's a lot of mouths to feed. This was the quantity of bread that the Normans were eating in uh, 1066. How many people need that? Not one person? No. That's the quantity of bread for five persons a day. Compared to this quantity of bread today, at the Normans' time, uh, there were 70% uh, of the alimentation based on the bread. 70% of their daily intake is bread? Yeah. So imagine how much bread you need for an army of, you know, around 14,000 people. Yeah, yeah. Wagons of flour. Now, it's been estimated, if you assume that William had a force of around 14,000 
people here in Dive. That would have required 14 tons of flour brought to feed that army every day to make 6,000 of these guys every single day. That is a huge effort. Two weeks pass, and still the wind blows. As well as continuing to feed his troops, William must also look after thousands of Norman horses. His crack cavalry was essential to William's plans, but with it came an inevitable problem. With up to 3,000 horses, that's a lot of manure. One estimate has it that William's cavalry produced around 2,500 tons of excrement while they were in deep. You add that to all the human waste, perhaps 450 tons, and you get 3,000 tons of poo. That's a lot. Bonjour, Sebastian. Hello. How are you doing? Not too bad, and you? That is a, a big pile of manure. Exactly. It's <laughs> fumier in French. Fumier. Uh, how many horses made this? Two. Two horses? Two horses. How yeah. long? Uh, one week. Wow. So imagine what 3,000 horses would produce. Yeah, a very big pile. <laughs> All that manure spelt danger. It could spread diseases like dysentery, which would put pay to William's dreams of conquest. So William's men had to load up all that human and animal waste into carts to transport it miles away from camp to a safe distance. That's around 5,000 cartloads of waste taken out into the countryside. Yet another two weeks pass. Summer will soon turn into autumn. And William's great plans are teetering on the edge of collapse. These kind of hostile conditions are very unusual in the summer in the channel. We've mocked up a weather chart showing the kind of conditions that he faced through the summer of 1066. Here's a big area of low pressure, and the wind goes round it in an anti-clockwise fashion. That means northerly gales banging in here, keeping the fleet locked in at Dives sur mer now, I've sailed on the channel a lot, and you cannot put to sea in these kind of conditions, particularly with the more primitive ships and rig that they had in the 11th century. As summer began to turn into autumn, time was slipping through William's fingers, and he must have been getting completely desperate. Three warriors, the most powerful warlords in Europe, can rule kingdoms, but not the weather. Across the channel in England, King Harold waited and waited, but no invasion came. The English king must have been tempted to hope that his kingdom was secure. There was no sign of William, and Hardrada hadn't showed his hand yet either. But all that was about to change. Vikings are on the move. The same northerly winds that keep William trapped in Dives carry Hardrada towards England, where he's planning to attack with Tostig, poised, waiting in his Scottish base. Soon we will be filling England's graveyards and feeding the crows and the rotting corpses of her men. Now the northerly winds are blowing me and my Viking warriors across the North Sea. Now this is a distance of about 300 miles, and with a northeast wind at my back, it should take two or three days to cross. So we stop first at Shetland to take provisions, and again at Orkney. And then I continue down the east coast of Scotland towards England. A week later, Hardrada joins with Tostig and his men in Northumbria. The deposed Earl is back. 
And so are the Vikings. Meanwhile, Harold is still on the Isle of Wight, oblivious to the immediate danger. He continues to look only towards Normandy. It's the bastard playing that. Eh? I'm waiting forever. It's now September, and Harold knows he will soon have to release his army. As summer turned to autumn, King Harold had a big problem. The two months of service that his levies had to provide had come to an end. The English army was running out of food, and there was the added pressure that the men were needed at home to help gather in the harvest. Harold's hand was being forced. He could only hope that the end of summer also meant an end to any threat of an attack from William. So on the 8th of September, 1066, Harold sent his men home and ordered his fleet to return to London. What choice have I got? I can't keep the army at arms indefinitely. And anyway, autumn is coming, and I'm pretty sure you're not going to risk crossing the channel with an invasion force in September. Actually, I have no intention of standing down, because I learn that you have stood down your army and what that means is that the south of England now stands undefended. Look, I've no idea what's going on down here in the south, and frankly, I don't really care either, because my plan up in the north is going like clockwork. We're going to continue down the coast to the mouth of the Humber, we're going to sail up the River Ouse, and we're going to attack York. York the ancient Viking capital of England. For Hardrada, his first target, and a base from which he could conquer the entire country. Hardrada and Toste are poised to take control. First, the north, then a march to London, and the prize of Harold's throne. Three days later, the terrible news that a Viking fleet has landed reaches Harold. What do we do now? Fight. It's in our country, destroying our lands and our people. We have no choice. How incredibly galling for Harold to discover that the minute he's dispersed his great army, his brother and Hardrada have invaded. He's got to put it all back together again, really quickly. This is a body blow. It has come completely out of the blue. The only thing I can do is get my army back together and head north fast to take you on. And I have got a gamble that you are not going to cross the channel in autumn. Then you really do not know me because I remain as determined as ever to cross the channel, reach the south and strike hard at your now undefended vitals. After six weeks of waiting, William had had enough. He decided to defy the winds and set sail. It would prove to be a rash decision. After months of careful planning, William has to gamble. He knows that time is running out. And so he takes his entire force from safe harbor into a stormy sea. It was a disaster. William lost ships and men. And instead of crossing the channel, he was forced to take refuge 140 miles to the east at saint valery in France. I'm going to admit things could be better. In fact, they are verging on the desperate. I have lost ships and I've lost a large quantity of men in the storm. On the plus side, I am, of course, now that much closer to England. But contrary winds continue to blow, and I am still on the wrong side of the channel. It's very frustrating.
storm battered, William's dream of the English throne is becoming a nightmare. Meanwhile, Harold musters a new army, but he too is on the back foot. He's a long way south of York, and any chance of meeting the Viking threat. Right now, it's the Dark Horses, Hardrada and Tostig, who have a fresh and powerful army ready to strike. Facing them, only a regional force, led by the Northern Earls. Somehow they must take on the full might of the Vikings and their arch enemy, Tostig. The two forces met at Fulford, just two miles from the gates of York. Chaz Jones has been excavating the battle site for over 20 years. Standing here in 1066, what would we have seen? Well, we are standing on a landscape that the people who were there would have recognised. Here we've got the English standing on this side of the ditch. Over there we've got the Vikings, round about 6,000 of them, ready to do battle. What they've got to do is they've got to get across this water-filled ditch. The tide is in, which is keeping them apart. They're standing there shouting at each other, waiting for the tide to drop so they can actually engage in battle. <laughs> English are lined up here between the river on the one side and this swampy higher ground on the other side. This blocks the way to York. Now, this doesn't really bother me because I've got a plan. I've divided my forces in two. We've got some Vikings here together with Tostig's men. They're facing the English, but I am here with my best troops hidden away out of sight round a bend in the river. So when the tide goes out, it's going to drain this ditch of water. And my front line is going to advance towards the English. Now, all the English actually need to do is hold their lines. they get drawn into the fight and that's the moment for my secret weapon so I advance with my best troops along the bend in the river and I attack the English from the rear trapping them and this is a glorious bloodbath Chaz, you have dug this battlefield, haven't you? What have you found? We found some amazing stuff. These are bits of bone which we found at the lair that we can date to the 11th century, so from the time of the battle. It's very unusual to find just random bits of bone in the soil because people are normally buried. Now, you do find the odd animal bone, but these are human bone, almost certainly. These probably rib bones. Wow, so you could be holding your hands the remains of someone who was killed in the battle here in 1066. It's very probable. Hardrada and Tostig were victorious. The old Viking capital of York surrendered to them. The great prize of England was within their grasp. See you later. Kiss Meanwhile, William is still trapped. With Harold marching north, he knows that southern England lies open. But the wind still blows as the Vikings take control in the north. 
when William is stuck at San Valéry by the contrary winds, the Carmen comes into its own as a source because not only is it really closely contemporary, it is also local. It's written by someone living in this part of the world, so it is very well informed. And it tells us that William was in despair. It talks about him looking at the weathercock of the church, waiting to see the way the wind is going to blow, and being reduced to tears. The, the line that leaps out is effusus lacrimis fletibus aura Rigas, the tears streaming down William Treaks, um, it says, Desolatus Eras, you were in despair. If ever I have offended you as your servant, give me the sign. This is for you, in your name. Yet you send me torment. A medieval English writer adds to the story. William of Malmesbury tells us that this was a moment when everything hung in the balance and that all of William's army began to doubt that God was in favour of their enterprise. And we're told that they began to mutter amongst themselves. He says here, Insanire hominem, he is crazy, that man, who wants to subjugate a foreign land. God is against us because he withholds the wind. William orders the relics of Saint Valery to be paraded through the town in a bid to inspire his wavering men. And in a desperate plea to God to change the weather. But the northerly wind still blows. Five days since the Vikings took York. Hardrada and Tostig agreed to exchange prisoners with the vanquished English, seven miles east of the city, at Stamford Bridge. They're expecting a small group of unarmed men, but they're in for a shock. Where are they from? It's my brother. We don't know exactly when Harold left London to head to York. We do think he was in the York area on the 24th of September. The question is how long it would have taken to cover that 200 miles. Now, horses can travel 25 miles a day, perhaps more. So it's possible he made this journey in around about seven or eight days. One thing we know for sure is that Harold and his men went fast, and that gave them their greatest weapon, surprise. London, already? Who else could it be? Get him ready. Ask him, get him up. Help, 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 help. Not expecting Harold to travel north so quickly, the Viking army is unprepared for battle. The King of England. What a puny little man. He's a big man. Yeah. And he's old. So, we are approaching the Vikings, but the River Derwent stands in our way. And there is this small wooden bridge which we can use to cross yeah, over. Yeah, and we're not stupid. We know the bridge is small and narrow. It's a real bottleneck, which is why I've sent one of my best men to defend it, and he is not going to let anyone pass. Legend has it that the lone Norwegian heroically stood his ground on the bridge, stopping the entire English army from crossing, batting away spears and arrows. But then, some cunning English soldiers got in a half barrel, drifted down under the bridge, and killed the Norwegian with a spear thrust up between the legs. A 
OK, my man on the bridge might be dead, but crucially, he held up the English forces for long enough that Tostig and I could arrange our troops into this shield wall. This is an extremely strong defensive formation, and it's going to repel any English attacks. Andy Dean is an expert on medieval warfare. So when those two armies met on this field in 1066, how did they fight? Well, you've got the two armies closing the front lines, and it would be obvious who the warriors are. The ones that stand out are the ones in the armour. And if we look down here, you've got a plethora of different pieces of kit, the helmet, the armours, the swords, the shields, the axes. And the way that it came together famously, of course, would probably be with shield to shield. Yeah, I have got to admit, this is tough. My army are trying repeatedly to attack, but frustratingly, they can't get through the shield wall. It holds firm. But the Vikings had an Achilles heel. Many had come to Stamford Bridge without a key piece of kit. You want to try it on? Yes, please. All right, yeah. They're chain mail. Mail shirts, famously, are really, really good protection. Roman auxiliaries are using it sort of throughout the antiquity, and it's always been great. Oh, you're in. Oh, I feel like the Tin Man. <laughs> Once you put the helmet on and the mail coif that goes around you, the shield and the various other bits of equipment, then you become fairly impervious to most types of attack. If I was to take a sword to you now, and these short swords are, are reasonably sharp, hands by your side for a second, but if I was to basically draw this across you without the mail on, I mean, that would have opened you up to the bone. The more effect would probably be the cleaving in, where we might be able to do oh, some substantial... Well, I don't want to break your ribs. I'll okay, give you no, I'll give you a pat. Okay, yeah. All right, yeah. so the pat would be... Oh! Now, okay. what that Ur uh, has done has given you a moment where you've gone backwards. Yeah. And now I've already followed up and brought the sword underneath your chin, right. through your throat, into your brain and walked off. OK, and then I'd have a shield as well. You can use it, obviously, for protecting, but, of course, the moment you raise your arm, you would naturally... Okay. ..come up. So now I can grab it, bring it down, thrusting this into your groin at the same time. Okay. Come over and thrust. I get the message. And blood and, and horror everywhere. There are no rules. I will bite you, I will kick you, I will do anything to stay alive. And you just keep going. Amid the chaos of swords and axes, Harold also has archers. Hadrada's bid to take Harold's crown is over. Tostig fights on at the head of the Viking force. But the English now have the upper hand. King Harold had won an astounding victory. It's said that he killed his rebellious brother himself, cutting off Tostig's head. But the bloodshed was so severe that writing 50 years later, the historian Orderic Vitalis said that a great mountain of dead men's bones still lay here on the battlefield.
The Battle of Stamford Bridge was a disaster for the Vikings. There were so few Viking survivors that only 24 of a fleet of 300 ships were needed to take them home. This massive defeat marked the beginning of the end for the Vikings. From now on, their power would dwindle. Harold remained King of England. He'd killed a troublesome brother and rid himself of one of his great rivals for the throne. But another still remained, over 300 miles away in northern France. Two days after the Viking defeat, and after more than seven weeks of waiting, Thank you, Father. The winds finally change. The Norman camp explodes with joy. It's one of the best bits in the Carmen that talks about the knights rushing to get their arms and the sailors rushing to the masts and hoisting the sails and grabbing their oars because they've been waiting for weeks and months in the cold and the rain and now all of a sudden it's D-Day. Game on, they're going to sail. No more waiting. That afternoon, at high tide, William sails. 700 ships and 14,000 men. With Harold far away, the Norman fleet heads for England's undefended southern coast. One medieval French chronicler tells us that on the prow of William's ship, there was a figurehead, a wooden carving of a boy holding a copper bow and arrow. That was now aimed at England. With God and luck on his side, William would expect to land on the English shore the following morning. The third attempt to conquer England in 1066 was about to begin.